Hi guys, it is Brittany here from My Core Floor, and I am here to welcome you and to kick off our summer five-day Restore Your Pelvic Floor Challenge. Uh, I wanted to just welcome everybody here to the group. Some of you might be familiar with me and the work I do. Some of you might not. So I thought it might be a great thing to just jump on, hopefully for about 10, 15 minutes max, to uh, give you guys a little heads up on how the week is going to work about the challenge, and also to give you a little bit um, of information behind the strategies and the principles I use in helping women to improve their pelvic floor function. It's a little bit different, a little bit non-traditional. I have worked as a pelvic floor PT for the last 21 years, uh, going into my 22nd year. And I started my journey as a pelvic floor PT doing very traditional work, a lot of Kegel exercises, mat work, uh, bridging, a lot of the traditional core work you might be familiar with uh, using things like biofeedback and electrical stimulation. And just briefly, as I sort of went through the years, I started wondering if women were getting better because of what I was doing with them or maybe in spite of what I was doing with them. And I didn't like how that felt. I wanted to actually help women to accelerate their healing, improve their quality of life, improve their pelvic floor function, and I wanted to be able to impact that so they got quicker results. So I started doing a lot of studying, research, practicing things clinically, and really found a much more effective strategy to improving pelvic floor function for women, whether they're suffering with bladder issues like incontinence, urge incontinence, stress incontinence, uh, whether they're dealing with vaginal prolapse, maybe bowel constipation issues, or maybe even pelvic pain symptoms. The strategies that we use uh, will be able to help women with all of those types of issues. And so they are all well-researched. I've practiced them all clinically. Not only do I practice them clinically, but I practice them personally. Uh, I was diagnosed with a vaginal prolapse after my daughter was born uh, 15 years ago. And I can confidently tell you that I have absolutely zero symptoms of that prolapse. I know I have it because I do pelvic floor assessments on myself, and obviously I follow up my with my OBGYN regularly, so I know the prolapse is there and we monitor it, but I have no incontinence symptoms, no pelvic pressure from it, because I do all the things that I'm going to teach you guys this week in our pelvic floor challenge. So I want you guys to always know that I'm not just a professional who's sort of spewing all these things of what you should be doing. I'm also practicing them myself and practicing them actively. So hopefully that helps to um, keep you motivated and to know that I know exactly what it feels like to be in your shoes or in some form of it uh, because I have my own pelvic floor dysfunction that I also am working to uh, improve and to keep symptom free. So this week in our challenge, uh, we are going to do one pelvic floor exercise a day. So that means by the end of the five days, you'll have five pelvic floor exercises. Today, if you saw the exercise, what I asked you to do was to do it two different times today, those exercises, repeat them twice. Now, what will happen as the week goes on is I will teach you the new exercise, but then I'll say today's goal is to do one set of the new exercise and maybe one set of the day one exercises. Day three might be do the day three exercise and the day two exercise. We're going to sort of combine them. And then at the end of the week, what I'm going to do is give you a little video of all of the exercises put together into a mini workout. So by the end of this week, you will have five individual pelvic floor exercises you can work on. You'll also have a little mini, what I call quick hitter. So quick, easy workout for your pelvic floor to improve your pelvic floor function. In addition to the exercises, every day I'm also going to provide you with a pelvic floor tip of the day. Some of the tips are related to diet, some of the tips are related to incontinence, some related to pain, uh, some related to other behavioral things that you can change or work on to improve pelvic floor function. So every day you'll also get a tip of the day from me, okay? Then I will also send out an email because we have some women who are on Facebook and actively partaking in this challenge. We have some women who are not on Facebook who are just going to participate uh, via email. So every day I will send everybody an email with the tip of the day and the exercise of the day so that maybe you don't get on Facebook once during the day or you don't wanna have to search through the feed to find what you're looking for. So I will send you an email every single day. Now, 
every once in a while, email will start to go to spam or junk mail or whatever. So just make sure if you haven't gotten the email that you check your spam or your junk mail. If you still haven't received it, make sure you write a message in the group or send me a private message, whatever's easier, to just let me know you haven't received the challenge emails so that I can make sure that you are getting them. But our goal is going to be, we have a few people who just joined today, so we're gonna get them in the system and our email will go out tonight. And most likely, the emails will go out in the evening um, unless we're able to, I'm hoping that signups will go through today and then we'll close the signups. And so if we're able to do that, then as the week goes on, we'll be able to send the emails out a little bit earlier in the day uh, for those members who are not seeing it through Facebook. So that's how the challenge works. Now, if you are participating in the challenge, if you are commenting like I ask, so some of the posts that I put on will ask you to comment or ask you to post a selfie or ask you to give us some feedback. If you comment and you participate in the challenge, your name is going to go into a drawing. And at the end of the week, what we will do is I'm going to draw two winners to get a free uh, one month membership into my online pelvic floor program. So if you love what we're doing this week, um, make sure you participate because you have a chance to win a free one month membership. And the membership, we'll talk about it a little bit during the week, but basically the exercises you're going to learn this week, the membership has multiple workouts. We do live classes. We do education. So it has a lot of what I'm going to start to sample with you guys this week in the challenge. But if you want more, we're going to talk a little bit about the membership and give away a couple of free memberships as the week passes. We also have a couple other smaller prizes, so make sure that you are participating, commenting as asked, and we will put your name in for the drawing, and at the end of the week, we will be drawing a few names for the big prizes as well as some of the smaller ones. So that's all the challenge tips. So I just want to check my notes, make sure, oh, last thing, I don't want to forget. Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, so 5 p.m. Pacific Time, I am going to go on just like this uh, in Facebook here in our private group, and I am going to do a live Q&A. So what that means is that this is your time. I will stay on as long as you want me to. So if it's an hour, great. If it's two hours, great. Whatever it is, half hour, whatever it might be, but I'm going to stay on and answer all of your questions about pelvic health. They can be personal, they can be general, they can be about one of the tips we talk about during the week. They can be exercise related. If you're not comfortable sort of commenting and chatting while we are live, you can go ahead and submit your questions as the week goes on, either submitting them through the group. You can just do a post and we'll accept your post in and you can ask your questions there. You can private message me at the My Four Floor site. So if you go to our Facebook uh, My Four Floor page, there is a way to inbox me through there or you can email me at Brittany at mycorefloor.com and just send me your questions and we can have them answered um, anonymously during our Facebook Q&A. But if you wanna tune in live and sort of ask questions as we go through the live, that would be awesome also. So make sure you tune in Thursday night. If you can't make it Thursday night, I get it. Life is crazy and busy, no big deal. Submit your questions beforehand. I'll answer them in the live and you can go ahead and watch it on replay. Okay. So that's all the details of the challenge. The last thing I want to do here for a few minutes before we sign off is I want to do a little bit of a quick explanation about the strategies behind the exercises that you're going to do this week. Because if you've ever had traditional pelvic floor therapy or maybe Googled or YouTubed um, some exercises for the pelvic floor, they most likely, unless you've hung out with me before or are familiar with the work I do, they're most likely not gonna look like what you're gonna see this week or what you even saw today in exercise one. So I wanna just explain why our exercises look different, what the strategy is behind them so that you understand. I always feel like when women understand why they're doing something, it helps to keep them on track, helps them to be more motivated to actually get them done. So quick a little anatomy lesson and sort of principles and strategies behind my approach to pelvic floor therapy and treatment. So this is the pelvis, okay? So here's my pelvic model. Um, pubic, or pelvic bone's here, spine is here, okay? If I tip the pelvis, this is the pubic bone in the front, okay? And what you are looking at, make sure I'm nice and level, what you are looking at is what looks like a soup bowl of muscles. That is your pelvic floor, okay? So those muscles are your support system for your colon, uterus, bladder, and rectum. All of your internal organs sit within this cavity and they are supported by this group of muscles, okay? Now, this muscle that sort of flaps over on both sides of that pelvic bowl that you see 
is your hip rotator. It controls your hip going out and going inward, okay? It's not directly part of that pelvic bowl, but it sits right on top of it, okay? So you can see here, this is that hip rotator. Here's your pelvic bowl, okay? They sit sort of on top of each other on each side. That means that what goes on at your hips directly impacts your pelvic floor. Pelvic floor also attaches to the pubic bone, okay? This is where your abdominal muscles come down and attach, your groin or adductor muscles come up and attach, and because they share that common attachment, any sort of abdominal scar tissue, if you've ever had a C-section or abdominal surgeries or whatever, there is a link between abdominal scar tissue, there's also a link between just abdominal digestive function and pelvic floor. There's also a link between groin tightness, groin strains, groin pulls, and pelvic floor dysfunction as well. I have a lot of women who I've worked with who think that their issues are digestive. Uh, they think it's diet. They think they need to have a colonoscopy, an endoscopy. And in some cases they do, but I've also seen many cases where women have all these tests done because they're having abdominal discomfort and it ends up being none of that. It actually ends up being pelvic floor. So your pelvic floor can actually refer into your abdominal region uh, influencing your digestion, your bowel movements, constipation, abdominal pain, all sorts of things. So it's important to understand that because of this attachment here, there is a very close connection to the digestive and abdominal systems, okay? The last thing I like to point out is that your pelvic floor, in terms of attachment anyways, the last thing is your pelvic floor attaches to the tailbone or the coccyx and to the sacrum, which is the lowest parts of the spine. Now, many women have had tailbone fractures, whether that's during delivery, fall on the ice, fall off a horse, just a trauma of some nature. Uh, I've seen a lot of women that have had tailbone fractures. That will directly influence your pelvic floor because look, those muscles surround your tailbone. If this is fractured and there's inflammation in there and irritation, it's going to directly affect your pelvic floor. Now, it also attaches to your sacrum. So any sort of back or spinal history, uh, back problems, disc issues, degenerative changes, that can also actually directly impact your pelvic floor. So we know the hips affect the pelvic floor, the abdominal, digestive system, scar tissue from past surgeries. We know that the back, tailbone fractures, any sort of injuries there can also impact the pelvic floor. So what I tell women is that the pelvic floor is literally impacted by everything in this pelvic ring. It's influenced by the muscles, by the movement, uh, by how the other joints around it are moving and how they're functioning and what's going on there, okay? So I would say 99%, maybe more, maybe um, 98% or more of the women I work with with pelvic floor issues have also had some sort of back issue, some sort of hip issue, something that's predisposed them to their pelvic floor not functioning well. So what I will tell you is that the pelvic floor doesn't just decide to stop working. So it doesn't say, oh, you've had a baby, we're going to just shut down. Or, oh, you've hit perimenopause, we're going to shut down. Oh, you're postmenopausal, we're going to shut down. Oh, you're 18 or you're a kid or you're an athlete or whatever, whoever you are, we're just going to stop working today because we don't feel like it. Your pelvic floor doesn't just decide that. What does decide that your pelvic floor doesn't function the right way is that Something else in that pelvic ring is often not functioning in its right way, which means the pelvic floor gets directly impacted by that. So I want you to think about a couple things. When little kids learn to potty train, whether it's when you learn to potty train or if you potty trained kids of your own, uh, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, when kids potty train, they're about two to three years old. No one pulls out this model. No one teaches them about the muscles. No one teaches them Kegel exercises. You don't tell them in their car seat that at every stoplight they should be Kegeling because you're working on getting out of the diapers, right? It just, that's insane, right? It sounds silly. Why would we teach little kids how to Kegel? We don't. So little kids without Kegeling can improve their pelvic floor function and potty train. Yet as adults, when our pelvic floor stops working right, the only thing people tell us to do is Kegel. Well, that seems pretty dumb, right? We don't train our pelvic floor in the first place by Kegeling, so why would we retrain it when we're having issues as adults by just Kegeling, okay? That's where my frustration comes in, and that's where I started feeling like I, something had to shift here. There had to be another way, a better way, a more efficient way that made more sense, right? So I want you to think about little kids and what they look like when they're potty training. What does a two-year-old look like? They're up, down, twist, turn, move, crawl, jump, climb. They're always moving, and it's their movement that stimulates the pelvic floor. 
what do we not do enough as adults? We don't move like two-year-olds, right? We do a lot of sitting, a lot of commuting, a lot of driving. If you're like me, you're sitting at a lot of sporting events for your children. Uh, so we do a lot of things that lock up our pelvis and don't encourage movement. Even if we work out every day, if you look at the amount of time we spend sort of working out and moving and the amount of time we spend with our pelvis fixed and idle, it's an imbalance, right? So when we're thinking about that, I want to sort of explain that, not just say, hey, well, when we're kids, we move, and so as adults, we should move. It goes beyond that. So if I pull back out my model here, now you're looking at the pelvic floor from the bottom up. So if somebody was laying on their belly, this is the pubic bone, here is the spine, okay? You are looking up at their pelvic floor, all right? And this is your rectal opening. This would be your vaginal opening, okay? These are the deep pelvic floor muscles. And this is the, where they attach to that coccyx or tailbone, okay? And this is part of that hip muscle here. You can sort of see it on the uh, outskirts of the hip bones here, okay? That's that hip rotator I was showing you. And you can see I drew lines on the model. I did that because when I teach virtually, it's way easier for me to point it out using these um, Sharpie lines than trying to get the model close enough where you guys can actually see. But the point is, as the pelvic floor is made up of three major muscle groups, okay? This first group of muscles in the pelvic floor has muscle fibers that run vertical, okay? So if I were to put this really close, and it's a little tricky to see, there's lines that are actually in this muscle that run up and down, okay? Now, subsequently, this next group of muscles, the lighter pink group of muscles, their fibers run a little bit more lateral, a little more sideways than these ones here in the middle, okay? So they change direction. Then these ones, the group that's far in the back, actually run completely horizontal. So there's a shift in those muscle fibers as you move along that pelvic bowl, okay? They change direction. Okay, Britt, big deal. The muscle fibers run in different directions. What does that have to do with anything? Well, it's key, actually. So the direction the muscle fibers run in are the direction that the muscle needs to be activated or moved in in order to contract and relax, okay? So let's think about this in terms of your bicep because it's way easier to sort of imagine and see and conceptualize with a bicep versus your pelvic floor that you can't really see because it's inside of you, okay? So let's use the bicep. If you want to get a good bicep, you are going to grab a weight and you are going to start doing curls, right, to make that bicep stronger. Go to the gym, you're going to curl, you're going to do sets of 10, sets of 15, a few different, you know, reps and sets, and you'll go through, and eventually your muscle will start to get stronger. You'll bulk up through the muscle belly, okay? So let's talk about what happens there. When you curl up, your muscle fibers shorten up. When you curl down, your muscle fibers lengthen. If you go back and forth and back and forth, what happens is the muscle fibers contract, relax, contract, relax. And this accordion type effect or this back and forth type effect brings blood flow into the muscle. It activates and strengthens the muscle fibers and your bicep gets stronger, okay? Now, if you just took the dumbbell and you held it like this all day long, okay, your bicep would actually not get any stronger. It would actually get weaker because those fibers are shortened and they're staying shortened and they're not getting to contract and relax, which is how they get strong. So your bicep would actually get weaker, okay? The muscles are shortened, they're tighter, and they're weaker. Same thing if you just held the weight out here. Now your muscle fibers are elongated and they're also not getting to contract. So they're not getting to go through that contract relax process. Your bicep would get weaker. The arm has to move to trigger those fibers to contract and relax. That's how a muscle gets stronger, okay? So now let's bring that to the pelvic floor. If your muscle fibers here run back and forth, that means your hips, pelvis, and spine have to move back and forth to activate this group of muscle fibers. If these ones run lateral, they actually need you to move side to side to get those fibers to activate, to contract, to relax. These ones in the back run horizontal, so they actually contract and relax with rotation. So your hips, pelvis, and spine have to move in all those directions to be sure that they get all of the muscle fibers of the pelvic floor contracting, relaxing, and activating, okay? Now, there's a fourth way to activate your pelvic floor. It's the only group of muscles in the body that has a fourth way of activating, and that is vertical. So because these muscles sit like a bowl, when you move up and down vertically, whether that's in a squat, whether it's in a lunge, your pelvic muscles will contract and relax, okay? So there's four ways to activate your pelvic floor. When you do a Kegel exercise, you are working the pelvic floor vertically. You are taking this entire group of muscles, and you are lifting them up, 
and you are relaxing them down. You are working them as an entire unit, okay, which is great. Now, I want you to think about when you were in school, if you were to take a quiz or a test and it had four questions on it. If you only got one of the questions right, and it doesn't matter how right you were, like you got that first question nailed down perfect, but the other three were wrong. You only got a 25% on that quiz. So now let's think about that in pelvic floor terms. If you're really good at Kegels and you've done them and you've, you've done them in the car and you've done them in standing and bridging and all the things, right? And you're really good at them, but you're not activating those other three planes of motion well, guess what? Your pelvic floor is only functioning at 25%. It's the reason that most women feel like Kegel exercises don't work for them. It's not that Kegels are bad, okay? It's just that there are other ways to work that pelvic floor that actually mimic more of everyday life than just that vertical component, right? So think about walking, running. There, there's a lot of things that we do that we have to move front to back. We have to move side to side. We have to rotate, jumping out of trampoline, picking up our children, twisting to reach something. Our pelvis has to be able to move that way to activate our pelvic floor when we're doing those daily tasks, okay? And that's where, as a clinician, I found that the gap was. Laying someone on a table or sitting them up doing Kegels didn't look like jumping on the trampoline or like walking to the bathroom or like running or like coughing or sneezing. It didn't look like that. So again, if you want to run a marathon, you don't jump in the swimming pool. If you want to run a marathon, you've got to run, right? So if you want to train your pelvic floor to function better and be stronger in everyday tasks, you have to train it that way. You have to train it in the way that your body moves during the day so that your pelvic floor can start to activate that way. And that's what these exercises and this approach is. We are going to move your body in all different directions. I already saw a few comments from today's day one challenge of people saying, gosh, I realized my balance was really not good, or I really sort of felt that in my knees and other places. Now, when our pelvises are not used to moving in this fashion, you will feel uneasy because your muscles are engaging in a way they haven't been engaging. So if you're off balance, that is okay. Hold onto a wall, position yourself in a doorway, pull a chair over, it is okay. I would rather have you actually holding on and doing the exercise properly than trying to balance and be falling all over the place and then lose what we're trying to get out of that pelvis and that pelvic floor, okay? Now, I'll give cues as the week goes on about how to avoid your back hurting and how to avoid your knees hurting. Because for a lot of women that I work with, when they're not moving well on their pelvis, what happens is their body looks to go to your low back or looks to go to the knees to compensate. And so we will talk about compensations this week, how to avoid them. But the big thing I should remind you is that as you do these exercises, quality over quantity matters way more. Okay, so going smaller ranges of motion, don't use weights. Hold on if you need to. The quality of how you move is going to help improve your pelvic floor function far better than trying to take bigger steps, bigger lunges, bigger movements, not hold on. That doesn't matter. The quality of how you're moving matters. We want to start changing your habits this week, okay? So listen to all the cues, modify when you need to, hold on when you need to, and ask questions. If something feels really awkward, you're unsure, you're not sure if you're doing it right, ask away and we can be sure to help you out and guide you in the process. So I went over, cause I always go over when I'm talking pelvic floor, cause I get excited about teaching women about their bodies, about their pelvic floor and about how they can start to take control over their own body and improve their quality of life. So that is our kickstart to this challenge. Hopefully that excites you to be like, oh, now I get it. I know why my pelvic floor hasn't been working that well. I know what I need to do. I guarantee by the end of this week, you will start to see some changes. You'll start to feel some differences. It is not going to be a quick fix. And so we're going to get you started. We're going to give you a plan. We're going to introduce you to a lot of new concepts, new exercises, new movements, uh, give you guys some options of things you can try so that when this challenge is over, if you like what you're doing, we're going to give you some options of how to continue, what your options are to continue, uh, how you can continue to get support from me and from the other therapists I have on staff. So we'll chat about all of that as the week goes on. But most of all, I want you guys to know that I'm here for you. And so ask questions, reach out, comment, email, whatever it is. But let's use this week to help jumpstart you, get you back on track, and improve your pelvic health and, more importantly, your quality of life. So. Have a great rest of your day. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow with our next exercise of the day. And Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be on for a live Q&A. We'll talk to you guys then. Take care.